Let's pray. Lord, we come to your word this day and ask for your help. We pray for your help by your Holy Spirit to hear, to heed what you have for us. God, we pray that you would remind us of your love for us, that you would stoke our love for you, and that you would conform us to Christ-likeness in our love for others. Lord, we pray that you would use your word in our hearts, uh, that you would prepare us for every adversity that you have in store for us, that you would cause us to have a, a sweetness in our disposition uh, before a watching world, knowing that you are in control of all things, knowing that our citizenship is in heaven, and knowing that we, having been forgiven of our sins against you, have a father. We have an adoption and inheritance, and our home is with you. God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts for these things by your word, for your glory and our good, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we get to jump back into the book of Romans. We've been away from a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of Romans uh, for a while. In fact, it was March 1st that we were last in Romans chapter 12, and I'm really thankful for Josh filling in the last month, uh, opening God's Word for us, and has been so rich. And, and we have the opportunity today to sort of parachute into the end of chapter 12. We were in the middle of a section, and we were discussing what it looks like to respond to mistreatment. And at the end of Romans 12, we have this marvelous section which gives us a number of directives for responding to unkind treatment, responding to those who mistreat us. In fact, we've been looking at seven directives to responding. And these kinds of responses, the kind of responses that God requires to mistreatment, truly are self-emptying. They are counterintuitive. They're countercultural. They're not natural. They are, in fact, impossible. And so they must be grace-fueled, gospel-displaying, God-honoring, spirit-produced responses to mistreatment. Think back to the last time that you were unkindly treated. How were you tempted to respond? Uh, hopefully this text, this section of Scripture will give us ammunition for preparing for unkind treatment. We've looked at four of these already. In verse 17, we uh, were encouraged to refrain from retribution and to do obvious good in the face of mistreatment. In verse 18, we were told to pursue peace wherever possible. And then in verse 19, we were prohibited from getting justice for ourselves. Let's rehearse these, rehearse these again and read our text beginning in verse 17 to the end of Romans 12. I encourage you to find a Bible, find your way to Romans 12, and read along with me. Paul writes, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We're picking up today in the middle of verse 19. Paul begins that verse, Never take your own revenge, beloved. And we're picking up in the next phrase, But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is our fifth directive for responding to mistreatment. And simply put, we are to leave room for God's wrath. Leave room for the wrath. And remember that the hinge here in verse 19 is this little phrase, beloved. Don't take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath. And this little word, beloved, reminds us of the gospel fuel that makes this otherwise unnatural response possible for a Christian. 
You and I are to remember that we have been loved by God at the infinite cost of his son's death in our place. God loved us when we were his enemies. And so we are to exhibit the same kind of love by being reminded that we are loved. And the command here is to leave room for the wrath of God. In the original, it is to give place to the wrath. That is, back up, give it room. Friends, God does not need our help in being just. We are not to usurp his role in seeking out ultimate justice. That is why we can never take vengeance. And listen, God puts a priority on his own ability to take vengeance, to execute justice, and to do what is ultimately right. Nahum 1-2, the prophet says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. And Paul's admonition is, back up. Give room. Let God's vengeance have its place. How much room does the wrath of God need? You remember back on February 16th, we looked at Revelation 20 and the great white throne judgment. That future time when Jesus will sit on his glorious throne and and he will judge the living and the dead and the books will be opened and the dead will be judged by the deeds they have done in this life. Every deed, every thought, every word in all of its detail accurately recorded in those books, opened and every sinner exposed and judged. And everyone whose name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life is to be thrown into that lake of fire. And then the following Sunday, February 23rd, we looked at a biblical survey of the doctrine of endless punishment, the doctrine of hell. Uh, We wanted to see particularly what the Bible says about hell. And we discovered there that hell is real, eternal, irreversible. It is imminent and oh so final. The truth that God will have his day and that he actually will punish sin. Every sin that's not paid for and covered by the blood of Christ. He will execute vengeance and judgment on every single crime committed by sinful humanity. And that punishment will go on forever and ever. The wrath of God actually takes up a lot of space. It takes up a lot of time. The wrath of God requires infinite room. God's wrath against sin, in fact, requires an eternity of room, and it will never be exhausted. For anyone whose sins are not forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ, eternity will be spent enduring the unendurable wrath of God forever. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God is sufficient. It is sufficient to deal with the crimes of the unrepentant, precisely because it will last forever and will never be quenched. No sin can ever escape getting things right. No wrong will be left unpunished. This is what is so frightening about anybody who demands justice now. God, I just want you to be just. I want you to get all of these things right. I want you to right all of these wrongs. Look, it's a good thing for us to demand or long for justice, even lament injustice. It's right for us to seek to do what is just. It's right for us to long for justice to have its day. But you must understand that anyone who is not covered by the blood of Jesus will face God's justice and will be exposed. To demand immediate justice from God would mean to plead God's wrath against everyone's sin. And for us as a Christian to demand some sort of immediate justice against someone who mistreats us is, in effect, to plead for immediate transport to the great white throne judgment and to be deposited into the lake of fire. Worse than that is any Christian who seeks to make justice for himself by revenge, exacting little self-justices on our own behalf. 
Your beloved, step back. Make room for the wrath of God. The immense, terrible wrath of God is coming. But it is not our place to set all things right. It is our place, rather, to suffer wrongs. To pray for those who persecute us. To preach the gospel. And as Paul says of his own life, to endure all things for the sake of the elect so that they might obtain salvation and with it eternal life. To endure all things for that end. And Paul here in Romans 12 quotes from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, 25, where God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And this is emphatic in the original. Here it's really striking. To me, says God, is vengeance. This is God's territory and his alone. Vengeance belongs to him. God gives a very similar prohibition against taking vengeance in the book of Proverbs. I want you to look at Proverbs 20, 22. I think this is a really helpful place to look to see how God views our taking vengeance. In particular, because it gives the antidote to vengeance right here in this text. Proverbs 20, 22. Here the writer to, of the Proverbs, Solomon, says this, Do not say, I will repay evil. Instead, wait for Yahweh, and He will save. Don't even say, I will repay evil. It's almost as if Solomon in the proverb is saying, Don't let this even be on your lips. Much less take vengeance. <laughs> Don't even talk about taking vengeance. Don't even say, I will repay evil. Instead, wait for Yahweh. Wait for the Lord. And the Lord will save. After the prohibition, don't even talk about revenge. Solomon writes, wait on Yahweh. He gives us this positive command. Yahweh, of course, is God's personal name. It represents who He is and His character. He is that self-existent, covenant-keeping God of Israel. This is not like waiting for karma, uh, waiting for some inanimate idea of justice just to run its course. In fact, we wait for a person. We wait for our God. And what do we know about him? He is just. He is good. His plans and his purposes are perfect. His timing is irreproachable. He is omniscient and he is righteous. He knows everything, he sees everything, he knows every motive, and he judges without partiality. So why does God say in Romans twelve nineteen, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Why is it God's solitary prerogative to repay evil? I want us to consider for a moment sin's proportions. Sin against any other finite sinner is awful, it's ugly, it's bad. However, sin offended, offending an infinitely holy, good, beautiful, excellent, just, and right God is an offense of infinite proportions. This is a fundamental reason why you and I cannot repay evil. We do not even begin to understand what sin is. We don't understand the proportions of what has been done or what is required in response. Only God can comprehend the proportions of evil. Therefore, only God exacts justice. Only God can execute vengeance. We must wait on God for the final vindication of all injustice. And the word wait there in Proverbs 20:22 20, means to hope in something. It means to wait with an eager expectation to patiently anticipate. Waiting is the ability to endure a situation under tension while your hope rests in Yahweh. Waiting for God to judge is an expression of faith. Look, it's not easy to give up our grievances to the care of someone else. We think that someone else won't be able to feel what we felt and, and can't truly ameliorate our ills, our grievances. But God knows, and God cares more deeply than we could possibly understand. And terrifyingly, God will have his day. 
Charles Bridges, in his commentary on Proverbs, said it well. Revenge arises only because we have no faith. For did we believe that God would take up our cause, would we not leave ourselves implicitly in his hands? He's right. The antidote to vengeance is faith. Simply trusting in our good and perfect God who sees everything, who knows everything, and who will have his day. The Apostle Peter expressed this faith this way, Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. This is a fundamental expression of faith. This life is not always going to go the way that we would like it to. God's people will be mistreated. So what do God's people do? They trust Him, and they wait. They entrust their souls to a faithful Creator. He is the one in charge of the entire universe, and He does not go back on His word. He is trustworthy, and He possesses the power and the resolve to do what is right on behalf of His people. He is our God. We're waiting for him. By indulging revenge, you and I do more harm to ourselves than our enemies ever could. Think about every time somebody tries to harm you. We know what Romans 8.28 says about that. God uses all things. Orchestrates all things. God causes all things to work together for our good. God has desired that we be conformed to the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus, and no adversary can thwart that good plan. Our enemies cannot take anything away from us, because everything that we truly possess, we possess in Christ. It's bound up in Him, and it is unassailable. Our treasure has been purchased by His blood, and no moth can eat it, no rust destroy it, no thief break in and steal it. We have Him. The act of waiting places our concerns in the hands of someone who is competent, knowledgeable, powerful, and perfect. Waiting on God for justice produces a dilemma. It produces a dilemma for us. We know that God loves justice. We know that in this world now there is much injustice. And God has provided some temporary means of imperfect justice on the earth even through the institution of human government. Imperfect human governments are God's method of removing the sword of vengeance out of the hand of the individual, out of the hand of the one who's offended, and putting it in the hands of an institution. And we'll talk more about that in the next chapter of Romans. If humanity did not wait on God for temporal justice through government, or for final vindication on Judgment Day, this world would be an unending bloodbath of vengeance and retaliation. We, as offended individuals, we never judge things rightly. The reason we can't sit on God's judgment throne, aside from not understanding sin's proportions, is that we can't possibly measure the right response. Our indictments are inaccurate. The consequences we dish out are way out of proportion. Like the feud between the Hatfields and the McCoys, one offense leads to a greater retribution, and greater retribution leads to even further retaliation, and it only escalates. We must leave room for the wrath, John Calvin wrote. And we we do that only when we wait patiently for the proper time of our deliverance, praying in the meantime that those who now trouble us may repent and become our friends. That is what it looks like to wait on the Lord. That is what it looks like to wait for Him to have His vengeance. That is what it looks like to leave room for the wrath. It means to trust Him. It means to pray for our enemies. It means to long for their repentance so that they even become our friends. There's a sixth directive here in this list that Christians are under obligation to respond with under mistreatment. We are, number six, to return mistreatment with kindness. Look down at verse 20 of Romans 12. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. 
Look, if someone had mistreated you, and you were not waiting on the Lord to take care of things, and then you saw your enemy fall into some kind of hardship, you'd be tempted to say, well, good riddance. That's karma. That's just payback. Uh, the, the world is getting revenge. The, the mother nature or the universe is getting revenge. He's getting his rightful due. That is not the right way to think about these things at all. God says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he thirsts, give him a drink. Look, it's not enough just to not return evil for evil. We actually are commanded here to be kind to those who mistreat us. One pastor has pointed out that it's actually a kind of indirect retaliation when we turn aside our kindness from those by whom we've been injured. Right? Giving somebody the cold shoulder. Just ignoring somebody. Somebody has hurt you, and so I don't want to be kind to them, but I don't want to sin by taking revenge or, or saying I'm unkind, some unkind word, so I will just avoid. That's not enough according to this passage. If your enemy is hungry... Feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him to drink. Again, this takes a radical kind of love. It requires self-emptying. It requires sacrifice. It requires these counterintuitive, countercultural, unnatural, spirit-produced responses. Paul here is quoting from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. And it seems to be something of a strange picture. Be kind to your enemy, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. How can heaping burning coals on someone's head be an act of kindness? <laughs> in order to understand this passage, both here in Romans 12 and in Proverbs 25, that what God intends here, what is expectation for us here, is our responsibility to be kind. I don't believe the second part of this injunction is the motivation for our kindness. It is a sobering explanation of the result of our kindness. You and I are to be genuinely kind. Your, your enemy is hungry, feed him. Your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. What is God saying here about heaping burning coals on his head? We don't normally walk through sort of the interpretive weeds on a, on a Sunday morning, of thinking through all the possible interpretive options. But I want to do that a little bit today, just to help you see what's there. This is a, something of a difficult text, and if you were to pick up commentaries on Romans, if, even to read the study notes in, in your study Bibles, uh, you're going to find a number of different explanations. Uh, and, and I want you to understand how I came to the conclusion that I'm going to put before you this morning. There are a number of options that uh, commentators and Bible interpreters have taken. Uh, some have said that burning coals are just a symbol of shame, and your kindness heaps shame upon them and causes him to sort of have a fiery blush, embarrassment, and therefore remorse and repentance. In other words, someone mistreats you, and it's so embarrassing the way that you're so kind to them in return that they blush with shame and then are just so embarrassed they, they turn. That's one possibility that's given. Another possibility that's given is that your kindness heaps a punishment upon him that he just cannot endure. In other words, uh, it, the, the, the enemy who mistreats you when you return kindness in its stead, just it, it is so punished. His conscience is so burdened. It, it's like a, a hot weight of burning coals on top of his head that it brings him to brokenness and repentance. Probably the most common view in modern days that many modern commentators have taken up is an appeal to an ancient Egyptian ritual uh, where it was said that a penitent man would carry a tray of hot coals on his head as a sign of his remorse, a sign of his contrition. It was a, a public testimony of his own proclamation of his shame over his behavior, 
and, and he was heaping these coals on top of this tray that he carried on his head just to demonstrate to everybody that he was contrite. He was sorry for what he had done. And so your kindness is designed to bring him to the point of repentance so that he is sorry. And um, I, I think all of these views fall short for a number of reasons. Number one, the parallel in verse 20 is to verse 9 in, in the immediately preceding context where clearly God's wrath is in view. God's vengeance is in view. And a second important key here is that in the Old Testament, the metaphor of coals of fire was always a negative one. It always dealt with wrath and punishment. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, there are less than a dozen in the Old Testament. And, and here are two, just as a, by way of sample. Psalm 140 Verses 9 and 10 says, As for the head of those who surround me, may the mischief of their lips cover them. May burning coals fall upon them. May they be cast into the fire, into deep pits from which they cannot rise. And Psalm eleven six is similar. Upon the wicked, God will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. These texts are indicative of the other uses of fire falling down and, and burning coals on the head as a metaphor of judgment. It's a negative one. What is pictured, I believe, here is eternal divine retribution. In other words, the mistreatment of you will be taken up by God. And he will punish those who mistreat you, not only for their mistreatment, but also for their continued hard-heartedness in the presence of your kindness. You return kindness for ill treatment. God takes up your cause. God takes up his own cause and his own glory and distributes retribution in the fire of eternal punishment. I believe that's what is in view here. It fits the parallel to verse 19. Um, it is in keeping with the use of burning fire and coals in the Old Testament. And by the way, the, the other three views that I listed before, I believe want to get around the, the idea of the discomfort of burning coals, right? And the, and the issue here is, if my goal is to be kind to somebody, how could I want to do something kind that then results in something uncomfortable for them? Uh, something awful for them, even a matter of judgment for them. But you need to recognize that no view of this text can get around the discomfort of burning coals on the head. Right? In the first three views, the idea was that this discomfort would bring them to repentance. Our kindness, no matter which view you take, produces an uncomfortable result for those who have been unkind to us, no matter what the metaphor means. And so regardless of which view you take, your kindness cannot be motivated by their discomfort. I think we're tempted to maybe read this text, Be kind to your enemy, for in so doing you'll heap burning coals, as if heaping burning coals on the head of your enemy is your incentive for being kind to him. It's your motivation for being kind to him. And that's not the import of this text at all. This entire passage calls us to remove every ounce of vengeance from our hearts. To, to back up, to, to give room, to leave room for the wrath of God. The second half of verse 20 is not giving us the motivation for being kind to your enemy. But simply the explanation of the result of your kindness. You render genuine kindness, self-emptying love to your enemy. And the result is, God handles the effects of that. God will bring about the results that he intend. And as one author said, it is a fearful thought that in our kindness to enemies, enemies of our Lord and of ourselves for the gospel's sake, we may be increasing their doom but the responsibility is theirs. The obedient kindness is our responsibility. The bottom line is that we are to trust God and to be kind in the face of mistreatment. We are to be motivated by kindness and compassion and love. That kindness will have the result that God intends. And one result of that kindness returned for evil could very well be greater condemnation. 
but another possible result. If God would be so kind to use our kindness in the lives of gospel enemies, God may use that to produce a broken-hearted humility and repentance and salvation. Look, love can melt the hardened heart. The withholding of vengeance is one thing, but returning mistreatment with kindness is a whole other level of self-emptying of a counterintuitive, countercultural response, that which is unnatural and impossible for fallen man, and yet fueled by grace, fueled by the gospel, is a response that honors God and even puts the love of Christ on display before a watching world. That leads us to the last directive in this chapter, the last directive in this section for dealing with mistreatment. The command is this, overcome evil with good. Look down at verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Two simple commands, really one way to, two ways to say the same thing. Win with good. How do we win against mistreatment? Do we fight fire with fire? Verse 21 is clear. We overcome, that is we achieve victory we achieve victory over evil with one weapon. We overcome with good. John Calvin wrote, He who attempts to overcome evil with evil may surpass his enemy in doing injury. Right? You, you, you might win in a temporal sense, but it is to his own ruin. For by acting thus, he carries on war for the devil. To give in to anger, to give in to resentment, to give in to payback, is to be defeated by evil. Rather than making us happy or bringing us satisfaction, this evil only stokes the fires of bitterness and misery. Do you remember the last time you exacted revenge? When you fought fire with fire, maybe an unkind word, you answered with another unkind word? How did you feel afterwards? That kind of response never brings about the satisfaction that we imagine in the moment, but only brings about broken relationship, misery, and bitterness. The directives here at the end of Romans 12 demand a response to mistreatment that requires the emptying of self. This goes against our natural bent, it goes against our culture. We must be reminded of what drives us to these things. It is the very character of God, is the very love of God on our behalf through Christ. And it is the expectation, the command of God in this section. These directives are not easy. They do not come naturally to humans. I believe we must pre-think them. They must be pre-thought. They must be pre-prayed. These are convictions which must be pre-owned. You've heard it said that practice makes perfect. Well, the truth is, if you practice something wrong a hundred times, you will perfect the activity wrongly. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. And so we get little opportunities to practice this all the time. Your response to an insignificant inconvenience is a practice field for more difficult mistreatments. The way you react to petty slights and insults exposes your heart's true colors in the realm of revenge and of love. Are you ready to be maligned? Are you prepared to love in return? Have you pre-thought, have you pre-prayed how you will respond to mistreatment? Particularly if there is someone in your life that is hard to deal with or someone who regularly is in a relationship to mistreat you. Are you praying about that? Are you preparing your heart? Are you solidifying your own preparedness with the truth of God's word and an eternal perspective? This is the demand of love here in this text. And this demand is fueled by our being loved by God. In 1703, French Roman Catholic, a man named Bayon, 
had the regrettable job of being chaplain on a galley ship. A galley ship was uh, part of the French Navy, and the level of uh, rowers at the oars were prisoner slaves. Many of these slaves in the early 1700s were Huguenots, that is, French Protestants who believed the gospel, and they would not turn back from Christ despite the confiscation of their property, the loss of loved ones, physical torture, and finally this death sentence of being chained to their oars in a warship until it was destroyed and sunk. Bayon was the Catholic chaplain on the ship, and he reports that prisoners aboard the ship who refused to kneel and remove their caps during Catholic Mass were stretched across a cannon and beaten by a strong man with a rope full of knots and a whip. He was beaten until the skin came off the back and shoulders. Afterwards, vinegar and salt were poured into the wounds, and the victim was taken to the prow room at the front of the ship. There was only a small hole through which air could pass, and many died in the prow room. They were infested by vermin, others suffocated. Most preferred to die at their oars rather than be taken to the prow room. Bion, who later became a believer, writes this about these Christians on the ship. It is true that at the sight of the sad state of their bodies, I shed tears. They noticed it. And although they could scarcely utter a word being nearer death than life, they told me they were obliged to me for the sweetness I had treated them with. I, I went for the purpose of consoling them, but I had more need of consolation than they. For God who was their stay armed them with a truly Christian constancy and patience. You never heard them among the cries which cannot be refused to their natural state. You never heard them offer one word of impatience or injury. God, the Eternal One, was their comfort, and the only one whom they called upon for help. I had occasion to visit them every day, and at the sight of their patience and in the last of their miseries, my heart would reproach me for my hardness and my stubbornness at remaining in a religion for a long time in which I had noticed many errors and especially a cruelty which is the character opposite to the church of Jesus Christ. Finally, their wounds were so many mouths which announced to me the reformed religion and their blood was for me a seed of regeneration. What he's saying there is, he was part of the group of men tormenting these innocent prisoners. And they were kind in return. And their kindness and their trust in the Lord in the midst of their awful situation was the seed of his own new birth. We are to love our enemies. And I think it begins with us remembering that God loved us when we were his enemies. When we were at our worst, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God did not wait for us to change our disposition. God did not wait for us to clean up our act. No, when we were railing against God in the heart, when we were insubordinate to Him in our actions, when we didn't know how beautiful He was, and we despised His rule, God set His affections on us. God loved us. For us, therefore, to love those who mistreat us would be to be like our Father in heaven. It would be to be like our Savior who cried from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It would be to be like so many of His followers who in their final moments prayed for their enemies, longed for their enemies to become their friends through broken-hearted repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to close in the wonderful song, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. It is an ununderstandable love that you would look upon us in our vileness, in our rebellions, in our commitment to our own lordship, in our railings against you at the heart level, in our ignorance of you. 
and that you would be so kind as to open our eyes and soften our hearts and bring to our hearts the light of the gospel, the good news in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are forever indebted to your initiating love when we were unlovely, to your initiating love when we were, in fact, your enemies. God, we pray for our own hearts that we would be eager and ready to love those with a heart of compassion who may mistreat us. God, we pray that small inconveniences would be a practice field for us for measuring our own heart's response to difficulty and a readiness to love those who are unkind. We pray for help in this. We recognize these things are beyond us, and we need your grace. We need your Holy Spirit in us. We want to glorify you in this. We want a watching world to know and see the gospel at work. And we pray to that end in Jesus' name. Amen.